You are listening to Make Change Happen, the podcast from IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. In this episode, host Liz Carlisle and guests look ahead to 2021 as a super year for international action on environment and development challenges. Hello and welcome to our New Year edition of Make Change Happen from IIED. I'm your host today. I'm Liz Carlisle and I'm the Director of Communications. Well, I know we're all hoping that 2021 will see better times. We'll perhaps see opportunities where we can really work collectively across the globe to make change happen for the better. We have the Climate Change Conference of the Parties, and we also have the Biodiversity Conference of the Parties. And of course, we hope that a successful vaccine will help solve the pandemic. And we also hope that this will be equitably shared out across the globe at the start of this new recovery phase. So for our New Year edition, I'm lucky to have with me three guests who have some interesting and different perspectives on the changes that this next year could bring. We have Inesa Umhoza Grace, who's based in Rwanda, and she's an African ecofeminist working on climate change. She's the founder and chief executive officer at the Green Fighter, uh, and she works on the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition. This is a very strong message that youth inclusion should take us beyond advocacy and conference participation. It's about collective action for change. We have Dr. Tara Schein, who's for us, very luckily, the chair of our board of trustees. And she's also director of Change by Degrees, a social enterprise that brings global sustainability expertise and real world solutions to organizations big and small. She's author of How to Save Your Planet, One Object at a Time, published last year in April 2020 by Simon & Schuster. Tara's work is in constant pursuit of fairness between people and the planet. And if you haven't yet had the benefit of listening to Tara's lecture, she was one of three scientists giving the UK's Royal Institution Christmas lectures on a user's guide to planet Earth. And she will be able to be heard on the Royal Institution website from February. So look out for that one. Last but not least, I have with us Andy Norton, who's the director of IID. He's an applied anthropologist and social scientist and has worked on a range of issues related to social and environmental justice. Worked extensively on poverty, gender, social analysis and human rights in development practice. So I know we will get lots of great views. Perhaps to start us off, Andy, you could give us a glance back on what was 2020. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, Yeah, I think the big picture lesson that I take from 2020 is that massive change is possible. We saw change in response to the pandemic um, in countries that were heavily affected in health terms and those that weren't beyond, I think, anything anyone would have imagined possible in advance. International travel virtually ceasing, uh, obviously lots of economic activity shut down, huge changes in behaviours as well as policy. So it was really a lesson that we shouldn't always assume that um, change can only be slow and incremental and what people are more or less comfortable with. And so my hope going forward is that we can attack the climate crisis and the global crisis of biodiversity and nature loss with that same energy. If we do that on the climate front, then clearly hitting the right target from the Paris Agreement of 1.5 degrees of warming would be possible. That's really clear and really important. Three lessons also from 2020 about what we've seen in the pandemic. The first is obviously the importance of listening to the science, which applies multiple times to the global crises of biodiversity loss and the climate crisis. The second one is that early action really matters. We've seen that those countries that moved swiftly and also kept a track of what was happening as it went along and were agile and responsive did much better than other countries. 
And the final one, and perhaps the most important, is the importance of social justice, cross-cutting all of this. We've seen these really significant impacts of the pandemic on inequality. The data is kind of lagging behind the reality there, but we know that there have been very severe gender impacts where women in many environments have taken the brunt of the impacts. Um, but we also know that, for example, those in the informal sector or in the gig economy or in casual work have not had the protection that those who've got regular jobs have had. So massive impacts on inequality. And also we need to look forward and anticipate that there's going to be an international country by country dimension of that through um, the, the build up of debt that is inevitable at the country level. In relation to IID, I think it's similar in a sense that we pivoted incredibly energetically and quickly to a world without flights, to home working. We found new ways of working with partners, which were challenging, but also exciting. Um, and also we are um, in process of establishing IID Europe, which will be based in the Netherlands, which is also exciting. So a lot, a lot going on. But of course, everyone's experience of 2020 has been very different. Um, Ineza, tell us what this has meant for you and in particular for Green Fighter. Thank you. First, I would like to give a, a short description of, about who we are, the Green Fighter. So, um, the Green Fighter is a Rwandan female lead NGO operating in Rwanda with a mission to contribute to the creation of a better environment in the community through youth commitment and engagement. We started in 2017 and we are still going. And this year of 2020 has been a lesson learning for us, especially because we get to experience the, COVID, the pandemic, the COVID-19. Speaking for the fact that uh, I'm based in Africa, in Rwanda, I can say that the, our experience so about the global pandemic is a bit different. Yes, the COVID threatened our economy and the community health, but nothing can be divesting for me than the impact of the climate change. Because flood, drought, the loss of infrastructure and the loss of people is really something that moved my heart when you see people being forced to move from, from their house to another place in the middle of the night. Um, for, for an example, in in like March, there was this rain in Rwanda and this was in the middle of the pandemic, but we had to stop uh, the global fear of uh, catching the COVID because we had to move people from one location to another so that we can save as much of, of our, citizen, our citizens. So I can say uh, the, global, the global pandemic only uh, is, a, is a reminder that our earth is connected and is a reminder that the global crisis is also connected even if people uh, tend to forget, uh, but we, we, we in the Global South community, we are much more exposed and we cannot think about a solution in the climate change if we don't see how it's going to be uh, safe for our community in terms of achieving uh, proper education, even sustainable development. Ineza, thank you. That's a really nice example of how priorities are very, very different in different places. And it's really good to hear you keep that level of priority on climate change. And we know how important that is for you and your organisation. Um, it's great to hear that that energy is there. Um, what do you think are maybe one or two things you're going to be focusing on this next year? Yeah, that, that's a good question. But before um, I give what, what I'll be focusing on uh, on the next year, this year of 2021, I would like to say what was the experience that we had, we as the youth in this 2020. Um, so first speaking on, uh, on, the, on the side that we, as a youth organization, uh, we had to first uh, create our capacity internally in order to be able to deliver our action on the ground. This means that we had to learn much more about capacity building and uh, project management and project design because um, we believe we act to we act to prove that youth uh, inclusion uh, should be much more uh, much more than uh, 
uh, conference participation or event participation or even awareness because we can do much more on the ground. So we, we learn much more about how to design a project, how can youth design a community-based project and be the front line in, in implementation. We ended the year with the good news because we were selected through the Global Environmental Facility Small Grant Program. Uh, we were one of, uh, one of the selected organizations, but in 2020, we were not able to implement because of the pandemic. In the year of 2020, we get to realize that we were pushed to think much more as a country, as a continent, and we came to realize that there's, there is much more of a gap especially in addressing the loss and damage, especially in the, for the vulnerable community. So uh, in 2020, we started what is known as today uh, the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition. Basically, is a, a coalition between the Global North and the Global South Youth coming together to ask for climate justice. So what we do, we, we want to, we train the youth to understand what is the loss and damage. For example, in most of the countries in Africa, the loss and damage is mistaken as a natural disaster. So it can, we kind of provide information to get to know exactly what is the loss and damage and what's the role of every every individual. Even if you're from the global north or the global south, we have a role to play. And also we are creating, we want to create a fair fight. Or, but what I mean by a fair fight is like we have a community a voice on every decision table from the local and international level. So that's a really that's a really powerful direction for the year, and uh, I might move us now to to Tara Shine. Um, Tara, does your experience tell us that what Ineza is saying about that importance of focus and drive? How how does that speak to what you're thinking for this year? Thanks, Liz. It's really inspiring to hear the about the work that Ineza is doing with Green Fighter in Rwanda and that um, young people there are insisting not just on participation and having their voices heard in decision making, but also running and implementing their own projects. Um, And I think it's that focus on action that's really, really required now. Um, We we just need to not waste another single month or week of sitting around thinking about what we might do on climate change we need to be doing. Um, as the IPCC reminds us, every degree and every part of a degree of warming matters. And so um, turn that the other way up. It means that every every week, every month that we can be taking action on climate change, reducing emissions and building resilience, um, particularly in the most vulnerable communities, is so, so important. I am heartened to see momentum growing on climate change. I, I worried, I guess, like many did in March, April time, would, would, this, would the pandemic push climate change right off the agenda, even though I knew it was still there as a risk. And as, as Inyeza told us, even while we were struggling with the pandemic, countries right around the world, um, especially some of the least developed countries and small island states, were being hit over and over again by climate impacts. And they were having to deal with both types of disaster at once, both the COVID crisis and indeed um, in climate impacts. And so finding a way to continue to have that long-term focus on where we want to get to by 2050, to getting to net zero emissions and building much more resilient communities, but also increasing the ambition between now and 2030 with a really strong focus on the SDGs and on the interlinkages between climate, biodiversity, oceans, food, all of these things that are on the agenda in 2021 in terms of international summits. I think that's going to be really important. So expectations are high. I mean, are we going to see these met? What do you think? Well, that's up to uh, the esteemed leaders of our countries and the governments that work with them. But what I do think we need to see more of is a sense of uh, solidarity. We, what we need now is, a, is collective leadership, collaborative leadership. Whilst it is great to see individual countries, for example, leading on their response to the coronavirus, if we don't look across countries, if we don't look to how other countries in, the, in, in our society are, are managing, then we won't find solutions that help us all to be, um, to be resilient. And so I think it's time for a type of enlightened self-interest in how uh, our leaders look to collaborate. We've seen, for example, with, you know, everything from access to vaccines to 
uh, a reluctance to shut down fossil fuel companies or investments in fossil fuels that that governments find it easier to work really in their in their national self self interest than in a collective self interest, and that's something I'd love to see change in twenty twenty one. Fantastic, and I mean, I guess there's going to be so many factors that could influence the results of this this what we're calling the super year. Um, Andy, I'm sure. In fact, I know that you've got a number of thoughts on this. Can you share with us? Many thanks, Liz, and thanks also to Inez and Tara for those kind of inspiring comments. Yeah, I mean, the first point is that we need a decade of super years. Um, I mean, the challenge is so big. Um, in terms of the kind of signals we're seeing on the climate front in particular, um, which are um, alarming and go beyond, I think, anything anyone would have expected even like 15 years ago. So one super year isn't enough. We need a decade of super years. And important as the international level is, it's really setting a framework in which things drive forward in civil society, the kind of initiatives that Inesa was outlining, really important. Um, also in the markets and investment, we need that change as well as, you know, we need national politics to reorient um, really dramatically towards this, hu these huge challenges. And on that front, there have been some really positive developments. Um, obviously, the Biden win in the US is really important. It was very difficult always for the Paris Agreement to function without the US, one of the world's biggest emitters. But we've also seen, you know, these really positive signals from China, from Japan, from Korea, from the EU, from the UK, and so on. It's not enough yet, but there is a sense of, you know, the, the, the momentum shifting. It needs to go much, much further, but at least we're seeing that pivot now. But we have lost a lot of time. We didn't really have three or four years to lose when particularly the US's position, made it really difficult to make really ambitious progress in the climate negotiations. And um, going alongside that, the change we need to see needs to get locked in globally over the next four years in case, hopefully, there won't be a reverse in terms of the US position on climate action, but in case it does happen again. So in the markets, in civil society, in national politics, we need to see things get really locked in so that there's no chance that, that the pace of action will be reversed because this is a decadal challenge, not a challenge for one year. So thanks. I think your comments, Andy and Tara, really tell us how we must keep focused. We've got to keep the energy. We've got to keep thinking about working together to make this happen. But, you know, could COVID recovery, is it going to get in the way? Well, hopefully it won't. Hopefully it will be a factor that kind of supercharges the changes we need to see. But there are a couple of things, uh, clouds on the horizon there. One is the inequality issue I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, it's easy to talk about a just and inclusive recovery, but inequality has grown. So it's got to be really, it's got to have really powerful momentum. There's the issue of fair global access to vaccines, which I think you mentioned in the intro, Liz. That's also clearly coming up huge. And finally, also, um, developing countries need to have the resources to do their own green recovery action. And a lot of that is going to be about really ambitious action on debt and on making sure that the economic hit that a lot of poorer countries have taken over the course of the pandemic doesn't mean that they can't invest in a just and inclusive recovery, a green recovery from the pandemic. So Ineza, from your perspective and, you know, for the work of Green Fighter, do, do you think COVID recovery is going to get in the way for you or will you be able to stay focused and keep that drive for climate change happening? I would say in the sense in the sense that we uh, we see the the uh, the COVID recovery as the a unique opportunity for us to to change our mindset and to change our focus in terms on how we see inequalities between generation and how we see our uh, social justice. What what I what uh, what I can say is that it it won't because uh, if you see uh, the recovery in only in the health sector, then it won't be in a way of the global crisis. But if you take it as a, a mean of recovering the uh, our mother nature uh, environment, I think I think this uh, this is a good way to train the youth 
from every corner so that everyone can take responsibilities so that we can see a global action taking from the local community to international community in a more inclusive and active manner. I've really liked how your message is. This goes beyond voices. This is active participation. This is inclusion. This is young people being completely involved in that change. And I really like the fact that you have put a lot of effort into driving that confidence. Are you seeing that begin to happen? Yes. If, I, if I'm speaking on, uh, on the side of uh, the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition, I can see that this is something that is already taking shape because we, we, we launched our, our coalition in this summer. And we currently have the list of demand to the UK COP26 presidency, basically uh, covering all the demand of the global youth in terms of addressing uh, the climate injustice that is already being experienced in some of the community. And also taking consideration that through with the COVID recovery, we are going to attend the next COP where we people... I can say we people from the global south, we really hope to see some active movement in terms of the Article 6, the climate finance and the loss and damage and a little bit of the transparency. We really see it go, taking shape because in our coalition we have already youth who are already being uh, trained by senior negotiators from the LDC and we, we are keeping to breed the, uh, to breed the momentum with, the, with senior negotiators and already... Uh, initiated youth so that we create a more, uh, we reduce the generation gap in the, the negotiation room and implementation of projects on the ground in the community. So Tara, listening to Aneza, it's so good to hear about that really positive action. And we all have to do something, don't we? And you've been pushing us all as individuals through your latest book to think of the changes that we can all make. What, what do you think that the biggest differences will be? What can we all do? Oh, gosh, so much, I think, Liz. I think it, we have to follow Inez's example. So um, Inez isn't sitting there feeling overwhelmed by the problem of climate change. She so easily could, seeing COVID as a crisis facing her generation. She could be feeling very angry with us, the older generation, for, for having put her generation in this in this context but instead she's getting active. And it is, it's so much better to feel that you're taking action and to have agency in the face of some of the, these global challenges. And you know, climate change is an existential threat, so too is biodiversity loss. Um, so getting organized, participating, using your voice. We have an amazing influence on our peers, each one of us, whether that's our, our peers in school, in college, where we volunteer in our work, in our families. And so, you know, making a change, any kind of change in our life and sharing that experience with others um, really will empower them and encourage and motivate them uh, to follow your lead. So I think each of us has has more power than we think in that regard. And, you know, as I look to like the latest reports coming out at the moment around the continued level of warming, 2020 is on course to be one of the three warmest years on record. At this year, we may already and have average warming of 1.2 degrees. That's getting very, very close to the 1.5 degrees that is really our, our, our safe limit to, to global levels of warming. We, we have plenty of um, motivation for, for getting active and, and doing something is so much better than, than, than sitting, doing nothing and feeling overwhelmed. As we draw to a close on this episode, um, I usually ask people to say, what's the change you'd like to see? But because it's our first edition of the new year, perhaps we could think of it in terms of new year resolutions. Andy, have have you got a resolution you'd like to put forward? Yeah, thanks, Liz. Generally speaking, I'm not very good at new year's resolutions, not very good <laughs> at keeping to them. So I'm going to make a real effort on this one. <laughs> yeah. um, well, the, I'd like to just carry that lesson that we kicked off with through everything that I do and everything that IAED does this year, that radical change is possible, that we shouldn't accept second best in terms of the scale of the challenge in front of us. Tara, what about a New Year resolution from you? So so I'm also useless at New Year's resolutions um, and goal setting in general. Um, But I guess I I have one wish for the world, 
if I might start with that, and then I'll give you two little resolutions. The wish for the world is that we don't forget what we learned in 2020 and that we, we capture what was good and bad and, and hard from this year and, and really use it to create this change, the, this change that we want to make from 2021 onwards. Um, so whether that's that we don't need to travel so much, whether it's commuting or international travel for conferences, whether it's more investment in our local communities because we spend more time there. I just really want us to capture the best of what we learned in this year and, and make sure that we use that to inspire change. We have rewritten the rules of what is possible completely in 2020. That's one of the exciting things about 2020. So let's create a new, a new normal um, from 2021 onwards. And that I think is really exciting. And I think that done the right way will help us to drive emissions down, will help us to protect nature. And if we really get it right, will be inclusive and help us to address the ever-growing problem of inequality. And then my two resolutions are to continue to try and inspire individuals to feel powerful um, in the face of uh, the climate emergency. Um, so I, I do that through messaging, uh, as in my book that you mentioned, thanks Liz, How to Save Your Planet One Object at a Time. Through that, I really want to democratize um, climate action and what it is to be sustainable, to make it for everybody, not just some people that identify as being green. And the second resolution I have for this year is to really work harder and harder at communicating about sustainability and climate change. Uh, we're still not getting it right. We're getting closer. We're, we're much better. Um, but one thing I really want you to do uh, this year and in the coming years is to use the SDGs a lot more um, to help create these connections about all the things that I care about uh, between justice and gender equality, climate, life in our oceans, um, biodiversity, um, healthy cities, all of these things. I, I, the SDGs are a fantastic template to help us do this. So I want to use them more to help me communicate better. Thank you. We're going to be busy. I can tell that <laughs> there's going to be no rest for us. Um, Ineza, what would be a kind of big change for your new normal that you feel people could really get behind this year? What, 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 what would be a resolution that people could make and, and forge ahead with? This is a good question because it requests me to see what kind of future I want to have and what needs to change in order for me to get it. And if I can say the one thing that I want to see changing is the tokenistic youth approaches in uh, decision making on the national and international level and the global recognition that the youth can really contribute on the ground with concrete results in the com community. Uh, so I would like to see Mutual Forum, decision maker making the uh, platform, but inviting the youth and listening to their concern and also ske sketching the solution with them so that even women and children are incorporated. Because whatever whatever is ha happened in the past, I don't want to say it's a fault for the uh, old generation. I want to say it's a lesson learned. So the current generation need to only accept the past mistake and work with the next generation to create a new normal, which will be transmitted to the children and so that we can have a sustainable uh, planet and the future for everyone. Thank you so much, Ineza. I, th I think that is a, a wonderful finish to this program. And I, I'd like to thank you all. I think it's quite clear from all of you that this is about collective action globally, and it's about individual action, and it's about working across age groups, institutions, different groups of people, different countries all coming together. And I really liked what Ineza said about, it makes her think about what is the future that she wants to have and how can she work to get it? And I think for my new year resolution, I need to take that into account and to think about how to make my voice count. Thank you all very much, Ineza Umhosa Grace, Dr. Tara Shine, and Andrew Norton. Thank you very much for your views and ideas. Listeners, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it with a friend or uh, your community, your stakeholders. Uh, we very much appreciate any feedback that you can give us. And we're always looking out for uh, new ways to improve and work on Make Change Happen. 
may I wish you all the very best for 2021. And let's keep our ambition high and hope that our expectations can be met. Many thanks. You can find out more about this episode and our guests and their work on our website at www.iied.org slash podcast, where you can also listen to more episodes. Podcast is produced by our in-house communications team. For more information about IIED's work, please visit us online at www.iied.org.